So this is from Annie Dillard's Teaching a Stone to Talk. And I lost, misplaced my other books. I grabbed this one this morning. Um, it's from the titular essay. It's about a man who is <laughs> trying to teach a stone how to talk. And she's saying, I'm just going to read the whole section five here. We are here to bear witness, to witness. There is nothing else to do with those mute materials we do not need. Until Larry teaches his stone to talk, until God changes his mind, or until the pagan gods slip back into their hilltop groves, all we can do with the whole inhuman array is watch it. We can stage our own act on the planet, build our cities on its plains, dam its rivers, plant its, its topsoils, but our meaningful activity scarcely covers the terrain. We do not use the songbirds, for instance. We do not eat many of them. We cannot befriend them. We cannot persuade them to eat more mosquitoes or plant fewer weed seeds. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. All this becomes especially clear on the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands are just plain here and little else. They blew up out of the ocean. Some plants blew on them. Some animals drifted aboard and evolved weird forms. And there they all are, whoever they are, in full swing. You can go there and watch it happen and try to figure it out. The Galapagos are a kind of metaphysical laboratory, almost unholy, almost wholly uncluttered by human culture or history. Whatever happens on those bare volcanic rocks happens in full view, whether anybody is watching or not. What happens there is this, and precious little it is. Clouds come and go in the round of similar seasons. A pig eats a tortoise or doesn't eat a tortoise. Pacific waves fall up and slide back. A lichen expands, night follows day. An albatross dies and dries on a cliff. A cool current upswells from the ocean floor. Fishes multiply, flies swarm. Stars rise and fall, and diving birds dive. The news, in other words, breaks on the beaches. And taking it all in are the trees. The Palo Santo trees crowd the hillsides like any outdoor audience. They face the lagoons, the lava lowlands, and the shores. I have some experience of these Palo Santo trees. They interest me as emblems of the muteness of the human stance in relation to all that is not human. I see us all as Palo Santo trees, holy sticks, together watching all that we watch and growing in silence. In the Galapagos, it took me a long time to notice the Palo Santo trees. Like everyone else, I specialized in sea lions. My, ship, my, my shipmates and I liked the sea lions and envied their lives. Their joy seemed conscious. They were engaged in full-time play. They were all either fat or dead. There was no halfway. By day, they played in the shallows, alone or together, greeting each other and us with great noises of joy, and they took a turn offshore and body surfed in the breakers, exultant. By night on the sand, they lay in each other's flippers and slept. Everyone joked often that when, we, when he came back, he would just as soon do it all over again as a sea lion. I concurred. The sea lion game looked unbeatable. But a year and a half later, I returned to those unpeopled islands. In the interval, my attachment to them had shifted, and my memories of them had altered, the way memories do, like particolored pebbles rolled back and forth over a grating, so that after a time, those hard, bright ones, the ones you thought you would never lose, have vanished, passed through the grating, and only a few big, unexpected ones remain, no longer unnoticed, but now selected out for some meaning, large and unknown. Such were the Palo Santo trees. Before, I had never given them a thought, they were just miles of half-dead trees on the red lava sea cliffs of some deserted islands. They were only a name in a notebook. Palo Santa, those strange white trees. Look at the sea lions. Look at the flightless uh, cormorants, the penguins, the iguanas, the sunset. But after 18 months, and the wonderful cormorants, penguins, iguanas, sunsets, and even the sea lions had dropped from my holy heart. I returned to the Galapagos to see the Palo Santo trees. They are thin, pale, wispy trees. You walk among them on the lowland deserts, where they grow beside prickly pear, beside the prickly pear. You see them from the water on the steeps that face the sea, hundreds together, small and thin and spread, and so much more pale than their red soils that any black and white photograph of them looks like a negative. Their stands look like blasted orchards. At every season, they all look newly dead, pale, 
and bare as birches drowned in a beaver pond. For at every season they look leafless, paralyzed, and mute. But in fact, if you look closely, you can see during the rainy months a few meager deciduous leaves here and there on their brittle twigs. And hundreds of lichens, lichens always grow on their bark in mute overlapping explosions which barely enlarge in the course of the decade. Lichens pink and orange, lavender, yellow, and green. The Palo Santo trees bear the lichens effortlessly, unconsciously, the way they bear everything. Their multitudes, transparent as line drawings, crowd the cliff sides like whirling dancers, like empty groves, and look over, out over cliff wrecked beat by breakers toward more unpeopled islands, with their freakish lizards and birds, toward the grieving lagoons and the bays where the sea lions wander, and beyond to the clamoring seas. Now I no longer concur. I know this is getting long. I'm just going to finish, though. I know, now I no longer concurred with my shipmate's joke. I no longer wanted to come back as a sea lion. For I thought, and I still think, that if I came back to life in the sunlight where everything changes, I would like to come back as a Palo Santo tree, one of thousands on a cliffside on those godforsaken islands where a million events occur among the witless, where a splash of rain may drop on a yellow iguana the size of a dashund, and ten minutes later the iguana may blink. I would like to come back as a Palo Santo tree on the weather side of an island, so that I could be myself a perfect witness and look mute and wave my arms. I too would like to come back as a Palo Santo tree, I guess. I'm going to be a little late for work because I'm dawdling here with the, uh, the YouTube peanut gallery. Um, but, um, you know, I'm just like that iguana. Here in my car, I can only receive. It's the only way to live in cars. Lock all my doors, got my defenses up. Been through a somewhat harrowing weekend. I tried to make a video yesterday, but it was just sort of undoable with uh, the children. <laughs> um, what I really wanted to talk about, and I guess what I'll, I'll introduce and then try to relate, um, is um, a video, a, a lecture. This, this feels a little rehearsed now because I, I made a video that I've now abandoned, I guess. Uh, but I, I rewatched a lecture by Emmanuel Todd um, given a, a few years ago, five or six years ago now, I guess. Um, on um, the fate of Europe, Emmanuel Todd is sort of ha has an interesting pedigree. He's, he uh, he's of the same family as Tocqueville. Um, he's a French Jew, um, sort of atheistic, I think, um, sort of liberal pro-American Frenchman, though. Um, and he's a he's a demographer, and uh, demography is a kind of political cheat code um, that allows you to make all kinds of pronouncements and prophetic sayings um, without having to do all the hard legwork of uh, theorizing in strict political terms. But in a nutshell, um, Emmanuel Todd's big idea is that there are a set number of characteristics, I think specifically four characteristics, which define a family system. And there are different forms of family systems throughout the world. So the, the four characteristics are inheritance, cohabitation with parents, um, marriage between cousins, I forget the technical term, um, and uh, polygamy. Um, and based on the breakdown, combination of, of those different factors, you, you get different family systems. So, you know, he, he, France, he says, is a great place to, to study this because in Paris and in the, the, 
the Paris Basin, you, you get one type of family system, and out, outside you get something that's, that's more German. Um, but um, in Europe, because, you know, there, there's no cousin marriage, basically, and um, no polygamy, um, the real differentiating factor is inheritance. Um, and so in, in France, um, traditionally, the egalitarian, the egalitarian France traditionally uh, gives an equal share of inheritance to all children, um, which is, is sort of one view of justice. Um, and that view sort of has political reverberations, um, according to Todd. Um, whereas the German system, and I think also the Japanese and the, and the Jewish family system by and large, um, gives, uh, holds to the, the principle of primogeniture by which the, the eldest son inherits everything, more or less. Um, and in contrast, the English in the Anglosphere individuals have the right to bequeath however they damn uh, please, you know, you, you can you can write up a will and <laughs> leave everything to a stone if you want you know, English law is very loosey-goosey um, and arguably that that led to the rise of feminism in, uh, in uh, the English world because uh, you, could, you could leave things to, to women um, but um, Emmanuel Todd in, in the 70s predicted the fall of the Soviet Union with the, the use of this cheat code because he said, look, you, you have within the Soviet bloc different family systems. I forget all the details. Um, the go-to book for this, it's out of print, is called The Explanation of Ideology. Um, and I don't know how convincing others find it. I personally find it very compelling. Um, and uh, I'll, you know, I'll link the, this lecture down below in the description for anyone who's, who's watching. Um, but um, my own situation, my own life situation right now where I'm, I'm living with my parents. So, <laughs> again, so the, se the second factor of this theory, and this, this relates to my life in the sense that, well, specifically because the last research paper I ever did in graduate school was on this topic and trying to relate it to the incest prohibition as it as is described in St. Augustine's City of God. And I, I was making some very esoteric uh, <laughs> little uh, Rube Goldberg machine of an argument. Um, and uh, the loose ends of that still still uh, still uh, sort of dangle in front of my nose irritate me like a, like flies at a family picnic um, and so I, I have some unplaced desire to return to this subject now and then um, and you know use this little monkey wrench of a theory and to explain things to myself and in a sort of abstracted way, explain politics in the world, but also use it as a way to contemplate my own situation and make sense of my own life, which might be kind of a fool's errand, you know, might be bringing a, a gun to a knife fight, however you want to put it, um, because it's, it's sort of a, <laughs> sort of a bazooka of a theory. Uh, it's demographic theory that, according to Todd, the, the, the fate of Europe is is sealed. It's uh, it's eventually going to dissolve, but not until a lot of damage has been done, uh, according to him. Um, which has to do with the fact that these family systems empirically do not converge. That he he assumed, as a, as a younger man, that these systems would eventually. Converge would converge with urbanization and modernization. But in fact, you know, even though the birth rate may have plummeted and factors of inheritance wouldn't seem to, to play a major role, at least according to Todd, and this, this is not, in the, in the lecture, this, this argument is, is not fully developed, but um, 
but the hints given are, are very intriguing. Um, and it's been a while since I cracked open the, the source text for it all that he, he wrote in the 70s, but the explanation of ideology. But I, I find it very compelling, and um, that, that these, these systems don't converge. And in fact, in Europe, you, you have a kind of German master <laughs> class, master whatever, master race, um, and insists that we, we need to stop thinking about Europe as this confused body that, in, in fact, it's a, a very orderly system with Germany at the top, and, and France is this sort of placated um, second in command. Um, Germany is butler, is valet. Um, but, um, in any case, the Palo Santo trees and bearing witness to things, and humanity and animal kind, and the confusion of living in a family, because, because in a sense, every everything boils down to family life. It's it's one of the most, you know, that's that's the granddaddy monkey wrench of them all. Uh, as the family, if, if you're looking for monkey wrenches and lenses, and things by which to to understand, you can't do much better than the family as a uh, as a melting pot and test tube binocular set for, for thinking. And uh, part of that is, in my experience, is that the family is just. Uh, is sort of this untamable thing, being the place where th where other things are domesticated, cats and dogs and so forth. It, it, it itself is is sort of impossible to dom domesticate fully. I was watching with my children yesterday an old episode of Mister Rogers, and um, afterwards on the autoplay from YouTube came a panel discussion between Mr. Rogers and parents on the topic of discipline. And uh, he was asking them how they discipline and the kinds of things that happened. And they were sharing anecdotes about times where their children really, really pressed them to the limits and uh, uh, they lost their temper. And um, it, was, it was just very revealing of the kind of the human condition. I guess, especially since I'm a, a new-ish parent, um, I find this topic very, very interesting. Um, that, uh, you know, the way we handle children and their sort of, their, their primordial willfulness has everything to do with how we were raised. And, um, And it's, it's just sort of this impossible thing. It's not impossible, but to to parent your own children in a way that is better than you yourself were raised requires a kind of rewiring and reconfiguration, recombobulation of your own mito mitochondrial DNA. Uh, your D to the N to the A. Um, because your natural knee jerk is to just lose your temper and want to force things in a way that causes you the least discomfort. You know, that children are not civilized adults and they won't respect your boundaries and the ways that you dissociate um, from reality, they, they demand your complete and undivided attention in a way that the rest of the world does not. Um, that in the, in the rest of, in, in the modern world especially, there's, we cruise around in these pods and we go to these places where we look at screens all day, at least I do. Um, and for the most part, you don't have to deal with fecal matter. 
except in a very controlled environment. <laughs> um, um, but uh, with children, you do, and the way any given society, any given country has learned to deal with um, with the issues surrounding that basic primordial reality of children in the world coming out from their mother's wombs and, and needing that tit in the mouth, that, that squirt of warm milk, milk, that milky, wilky milk. Um, it's sort of, in, it's just kind of intractable, you know, that you, these, there, there are these subtle differences and they, and they wouldn't seem to, to matter all that much in the long slog of history, but in fact, I think this, this cheat code is effective as, as a, as a intellectual lever, getting to level one in Super Mario World to, to level nine, you know, maybe I should have gone through levels two to eight so I could have honed my abilities and my, my aim with the fireball and the boomerang because when I get to level nine, <laughs> by way of this handy dandy intellectual cheat code, I feel out of my depth, like I'm swimming with sharks, and uh, I'm just gonna get all eaten up and I get beheaded by some kind of weird, monstrous animal from a, I don't know, the Lawrence of Arabian Nights story. <laughs> Speaking of Lawrence of Arabian Nights, so in, in the Islamic world, Todd is, is wont to point out um, cousin marriage is widespread, and that 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 is a tool of uh, wealth consolidation, and it speaks to a kind of hyper competitive quality of life in the Arabian world, which which has a lot to do with the climate of, of that place. I would suppose. Um, and the, the, you know, the whole area surrounding the Holy Land, um, is this, you know, Holy, the Holy Land is the land of milk and honey, but if anybody's ever been to the, to the Middle East, I went when I was 18 on a, let's say Egypt, uh, sort of misguided errand of a trip, mostly just stayed in my hotel room and read Philip K. Dick, um, but I, you know, I observe there are flies, and things kind of stink and swelter, and just the line between the have not, have and have nots. So, you know, I went to Cairo in 2007, and you see these palatial, you know, buildings, but then there's also the garbage dwellers, and it's like something out of a Final Fantasy video game. Um, we were, we were on a, at one point we were on a, a boat on the Nile River, and these children, like four and five, rode over to us literally like in like garbage pails. They were like in these like metal tins, and they were <laughs> they were like rowing, and they were begging. They were sticking out their hands, and they were begging. And it, you know, you see beggars, and you don't see, you don't see that that kind of beggary in the United States or in Western Europe. The United States at least has panhandlers, but only, you have to—you really have to go to like the third world, or actually in Rome you can see this kind of freak show. Um, but you know that level of of extreme, extreme sports—you know Tony Hawk level poverty. Um, it just—you know—it kind of like blew my mind in a way I couldn't deal with. I, I just when I was 18, I was there. And, I just kind of retreated into my hotel room and read Philip K. Dick. And, you know, everyone was going to the pyramids, and I was like, I just was like, oh, I'll take a, I'll pass, I'll take a pass on that. <laughs> Where I went to Mount Sinai, and everyone was hiking up Mount Sinai, and I was just there at the bottom, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a pass, I'm gonna take a breather here, I'm gonna read, uh, Why Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? <laughs> in my, in my bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone climbs Mount Sinai without me. 
<coughs> oh. You know, I was just a little, a little sulking Israelite. Still am, in many ways. Um, oh. But, you know, so cousin marriage is this widespread thing in the Islamic world, specifically cousins whose fathers are brothers. So, you know, you got two bros, right? And they're like, hey, what if my daughter and your son, you know, we go into business, you know, they have kids, then, like, we can be, like, joint grandpas, you know? Like, we'll be grandfathers of the same brood. You feel me? You feel me, bro? And then, like, they can work at our, like, lamp business. We can sell all these magic carpets and magic lamps and shit. <laughs> and we'll make, you know, and so like a lot of the family wealth, a lot of this like palatial wealth is like been like built by hook and bloody crook by uh, you know, these these brothers in arms, but there's a lot of negative consequences, side effects. Chief among them, the birth defects that arise when you generation after generation engage in this this uh, cousin, this sort of incestuous thing. So, so my whole research project, which sort of half baked Tower of Babel worth of research, before I before I jumped ship and and uh, and, and swam to shore, was was looking at the City of God by Augustine because he describes the, how the incest prohibition must have come about it was Adam and Eve at first right Adam and Eve were these people a man and a woman and they had children and obviously you know who was there to to, uh, to copulate with other than uh, your nearest and dearest your sisters your cousins you know so in the early world that must have been a thing and uh, at a certain point God was like no way Jose um Incest is a big no-no. Um, um, so that's how my thoughts swirled and whirled around that subject. Um, but there's there's more that could be could be said. Um, I'm no real political theorist, but um, I feel compelled to make sense of it, like anybody. Um, just just so I just so I know where I'm standing and you know my chief concern is really to understand my own life and to um, to get a grip on my anxiety and my um, my own frustration and sadness and um, and discontentedness and uh, inadequacy because I, I feel like I barely maintain control most of the time on my own life. Um, even though to all appearances, here I am, I'm driving, going to work, I'm, I'm doing something vaguely civic. Um, I'm, I work at a company that produces business cards and flyers and pamphlets. I'm just some kind of tech guy who greases the gears. Um, And, uh, but, you know, I've gone through these experiences and these, these things can, if, if, if I don't weed my garden, if I don't, if I don't apply the proper ointments to my scabs and wounds, um, gangrene can start to set in in my soul and eat away at me and is already sort of eating away and I, you know, so I'm on a course of antibiotics you might say, um, um, which is all the efforts I make and try not to make, because one of the big efforts I'm trying to make is to, is to, is to not make so much effort, you know, it's, in the, in the words of Oscar Wilde, <laughs> it's an enormous effort to, to act natural, to, to it takes great effort to keep up the pose of, of, of being natural. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel that. I feel that. Um, 
especially when you're raising children and um, you know you can't control everything and on some level you have to let it ride you have to have faith in God you have to you have to just not let it get to you and be able to to manage stress on a whole new level and you know if, if you if you manage it with the way you've been managing it thus far like the level just increases when you have children at least it has for me and like all your your defenses your normal site your normal defenses break down and no longer function and so you either have to develop stronger defenses to like beef up security to a ridiculous Egyptian level or you have to learn to take in more pain and more and sort of like incorporate and integrate more levels of your personality that perhaps previously had been segmented um, and um, it's no easy feat no easy pinky toe on the foot of a princess. <laughs> sort of a nons nonsensical Edward Learism. Um, what's that Edward Lear poem about the family that went to sea in a sieve? <laughs> Which is like an English word for colander went to sea in a colander. We were trying to make spaghetti. You know, I... I <laughs> and we saw that big ship sailing by, that swan boat full of Excelsiites. That alien race of super rich De Davos people. And I was like, ships ahoy, me familia. Trump has not yet raised his wall yet, we can still, we can still get past, we can, we'll have the children stick out their clutching arms, and maybe they'll toss us a Ziploc baggie full of Jolly Ranchers, because when we were in Egypt, we, the, the tour guide was like, no, 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 do not give any candy to the children, bad idea, <laughs> so we, like, threw them, like, bags of candy, which just seemed, like, so awful and gay. <laughs> These children were starving. Threw them like bags full of like, like the kind of candy you'd get at a doctor's office or a bank. It's sort of like sticky grind, you know. I'm just gonna rot their teeth. They don't need that. They don't need candy. I don't know. Maybe they need some candy. <laughs> You know, it's like I'm, that's, that's like me on some level with my family. Me with me with my dreams, because I'm supposed to be the leader. I'm supposed to be the leader of this little flying saucer. My my uh, my domestic church, my family. But more often than not, I feel like that Edward Lear poem family that went to sea in a sieve, rowing across the Nile River in a little colander, and uh, <laughs> just trying to bail out the water as fast as you can. Oh. I'm getting to work. I don't know how to tie up these thoughts. <clears throat> I will just say that I think speaking in the morning for me is is basically essential. It's a, it's a non-optional thing. You know that I'm I'm 30 years old and I've I've never tried essential oils, so I, I don't think they should be called that. They should be called optional oils. <laughs> but speaking in the morning, I think is essential for me. It's, I was trying to record later in my mind. Just, it just gets more jokey. I just end up getting more sort of hokey pokey jokey um, it's hard enough for me to keep things straight when my, when my mind has been newly calibrated by by uh, all the little guardian angels who tinker at it with their golden hammers in the night you know, 
wrecked the, the house of cards, which is my mind, but it, it blows out throughout the course of the day. It, it, it collapses in various ways until I, I'm like a, you know, I'm like those two stoners at the, at the intersection. Two stoners stopped at an intersection for three hours and eventually a policeman came by and uh, said, hey, what's the deal? It's, why, why are you stopped here? <laughs> and they said, they pointed over and they said, we're waiting, man, for that, waiting for that stop sign to turn green. And the, and the policeman said, how high are you? And they said, hi, how are you? You must be the nicest policeman we've ever seen. <laughs> That's how my mind gets later in the day. <coughs> I gotta stop smoking cigarettes. Why am I smoking cigarettes? Well, why am I not? What's, what's the big deal with that? Why not smoke cigarettes? Isn't there, isn't there a lot of misplaced guilt? Anyway, I should cut this short. Well, no, I'll just let it ride. But I'm just gonna let it ride. If people want to tune out, they can tune out. But for my own purposes, Even if my mind is wander, wandering stoner style, is there a way to bring the boomerang back? Can the boomerang be brought back? You know that. Speaking of the family, and right now I've hit some traffic, which will actually be a good excuse if I, because I'm already going to be a little late for work, and I can just I can blame Route 28 to my coworkers when I get in. Like, ah, Gosh, darn it. Um, but yeah, speaking of the family, I, uh, my wife and I, for a while, were seeing, and might continue to see at some point, this Hasidic rabbi, who is also a PhD psychotherapist, um, you know, that I, I fell into his clutches when, uh, Things were really not in a good way for me when I first moved back to Pittsburgh after leaving uh, graduate school with my with my tail between my blistered gams. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's a backup. It's a constipated highway right now. Um, it's all all, the, all for the better. All for the greater good. Anyway, I, I fell, fell into this, into this dude's paws. <laughs> I don't know how many more variations you could do on that. Uh, into this, whatever's hands. And his theoretical orientation was Bowenian therapy. Followed this guy, Murray Bowen who um, developed this idea that a family is like a body. And um, it's, it's a th the theoretical orientation is based on evolutionary science, which, as I've already revealed, I am highly suspect of. Um, evolutionary science. Um, that uh, in a pecan shell, um, in a peanut shell, um, if you observe animals in their natural habitat, the easiest way to do this is with an aquarium, if you'd like to do it in your home. And at, at this co-working space, when I, was, I was unemployed, I'd spend time at this co-working space and look at this aquarium full of all these fish, and it was, it was a where, very well cultivated aquarium, these different species of fish. The, I talked to the lady who, who managed it, and, and she introduced these species very gradually, and, and you could watch them in their different packs, you know, these, there'd be this species over here, and they'd be kind of big and flat, and they'd sort of hover on one side of the tank, and then you'd have this other species, and they'd be sort of thin and translucent, and they'd be facing in the opposite direction sort of at like a, at a, like a, like a western, 
movie kind of Clint Eastwood standoff. Um, um, on the other side of the tank, and they'd be sort of hovering, and then you'd, you'd see these sort of bottom dwellers who'd just be sort of chilling on the bottom of the tank, and, and then you'd see these real energetic ones, and they'd be swimming around, and would be a big fat sucker, and he'd be, you know, latched onto a, a rock, and then you'd have the tiny little minnows, you know, and they'd be, they'd be sort of darting around hither and thither and yon, and, um, <coughs> Um, you know, they, they each kind of had their place, and um, you, could, you could watch different dynamics play out, uh, specifically around things would get shaken up, specifically around times of feeding. Uh, so the, the, the little fish pellet was on a timer, and it would drop, and I would, I would come in to this, see this fish tank, and I'd try to time it so that I could see when the pellet dropped. Uh, and take notes on uh, on what I could see in this in this fish tank. And the idea is you, you try to relate this to your own family and to family relations more generally. Because you'd see, for instance, when the fish pellet would drop, that a certain family of fish would be more dominant, would insert itself, and. Uh, would go and get it, get the pellets, but like, some of them were more dominant than others within a given school, and so some would sort of like hang back, and some would, maybe one would be prodded in a certain direction, say, to, I don't know, run some interference or something like that in another family of fish, um, and some would just sort of like bide their time and, and wait and be more passive and, and kind of play this, and so... You know, <clears throat> that could be an analogy for family systems. It could also also be an analogy for different nations and the way that nations accommodate themselves. And because according to Emmanuel Todd, Germany, just by its very nature, is, is a more is a more efficient and dominant country. You know, just by the nature of sort of like I visited Germany a couple of times and. At first, with my my ex college girlfriend, because she had family in Germany, and we we stayed with them. <laughs> They're a very sort of like we got to do it right. We got to do it, you know, like eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sieben, acht, neunzehn, elf, zwölf, dreizehn. You know, it's it's uh, cruising now. So I guess I gotta finish this video. But uh, sky looks nice out. Um, um, but uh, in any case, these, these things are sort of intractable, and you know the modern tendency is is to want things to be more like Play-Doh that you can mush in your hands and reconfigure to your will. But but a big part of the 20th and now the 21st century is coming to grips with the fact that like beneath the fleshy exterior of things we can manipulate with our gizmos and gadgets lies a skeletal structure which remains stubbornly in place, like those Palo Santo trees, you know, that Annie Dillard and the rest of the travelers in the Galapagos Islands admired the sea lions because they could flap and flop around and make love and laugh and, you know, have their genital areas stimulated in the extreme. Um, but when she came back later, she was drawn to the Palo Santo trees. You know? And on some level, like, you have to reckon with the Palo Santo trees, and it's... You know, it's not that progress can't be made, but it's just that the pace of progress, the, the way we expect progress to be made, is unrealistic. It's... Well, I don't know. I don't know if I actually believe that. Maybe... Maybe... Maybe progress has to be made rapidly or can't be made at all. I don't know, this is an open question in my mind, because what I was about to say was that progress is more glacial than we would like it to be. I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know. I think it's, it's probably whatever it is, however change occurs, it's probably a little bit like how one improves one's posture. 
which I guess is sort of more glacial. You know, that when I when I was studying acting, um, come on, I'm gonna merge here. Um, when I was studying acting, um, I'm a very fid fidgety person. When I watch myself on video, I always notice how fidgety I am. You know, I don't know if it goes back to my childhood when my brother would box my ears. Kind of got me on my toes, you know. When I was a freshman in, in college, I actually developed a twitch for a while. I was, you know, I was feeling a lot of stress with being away from home for the first time in my life, extended period. And, I don't know, I had some kind of very tawdry experience with a with an elder statesman, a <laughs> senior girl, um, who did me bad, she did me wrong, she did me naughty, she did me raw, wicked and raw. <coughs> um, but in any case, I was, I was sort of an afraid and fragile state, and I developed a twitch that would come out in class when I was feeling inept. Um, so, you know, here I am with my, my sort of weird Philip K. Dick, Egyptian traveling brainy brain, but, uh, I can't keep my own emotions and my own nerve endings under wraps, so here I am in an ancient Greek class. I'm supposed to be parsing some, some verbs, some nouns, but instead I'm sort of having an epileptic fit. <laughs> And I think I've, I've gravitated towards life. Very, you know, I've spent time in sensory deprivation tanks. I'm very interested in science that, although it has a, a sort of creepy lineage, sensory deprivation tanks, because they were invented by this guy, John C. Lilly, who was fascinated with dolphins and used to take large quantities of, of psychedelic drugs and submerge himself in these tanks and had experiences with, like, extraterrestrial beings and all kinds of crazy nonsense. Um, but, um, but yeah, whatever it is, the way everybody change happens, it's, it's similar to how change happens with your posture. You know, I was studying acting, I took an Alexander class, which was very good, it was my favorite class, and it was, it was, it was the only class that was void, for the most part, of any kind of woo-woo, new age nonsense. It was, Alexander was, he was a famous Victorian actor who lo kept on losing his voice, and he, he watched himself in the mirror for like 10 years and developed this way of being and the, the, the way that Alexander, it only really works with physical touch, you know, but you can try to study it with YouTube videos, but, but really the only way it really works is with a trained person who's, who's done this, putting their hands on you, making, and through physical touch, you know, because I think a lot of this probably boils back to childhood, because children have perfect posture. If you watch a child walk, it's my, something my instructor would always say, say, like, watch a child walk. It's, it's always so natural. But as adults, we, we have, you know, we develop all of these, these sort of unnatural and un unhealthy ways of, of walking. And posture here being sort of a metaphor for our mental posture and our emotional posture and, and the ways we exist in the world. Um, but um, but a child, children thrive on touch, on physical touch. And I think a lot of the ways that posture becomes deformed in an older life has to do with ways in which we're sort of maladapted to, to our bodies and to, and to touch and... Um, and so, you know, but, but an Alexander technique, the main thing other than touch is, is simply noticing that, you know, if you, if you realize you, you have a stoop or something, the point isn't to correct it and to, to sort of overcorrect into a, a, you know, military salute. It's to, it's to simply notice it. And so a big part of, and, and once you've noticed it and once you've become aware, then you can become step more into that place where you're uncomfortable it's healthier it's uncomfortable because it's unfamiliar but to, to dwell and to sort of edge your way increasingly into into health um anyway just here i am noticing things and i'm at work so i gotta go uh peace